Ahuchtharan, Achorda. Um, it's a great honour to be here participating in Machnab and to hear the inspiring talks that have gone before us. Now, Margaret O'Callaghan has pointed out that people living 100 years ago in Ireland didn't know what was to come after and that we cannot evaluate their experiences as if they had this knowledge. Neither, I would argue, did they look backwards and see themselves as inhabiting a gloomy post-famine Ireland. The people who came of age in Ireland in the years 1891 to 1921 experienced dramatic transformations in all aspects of everyday life. The numbers of men and women working in shops, offices, factories, workshops, transport and communication, schools and hospitals increased by thousands at a time when population was falling. And these are raw numbers, not proportions. For example, there were over 7,000 more clerks in Ireland in 1911 than there had been 20 years earlier and over 10,000 more teachers and over 16,000 more workers in the new field of telecommunications in 1911. And these numbers continued to grow. All these workers and others like them had to present themselves for public view every day. And the resulting need for respectable and hard-wearing clothing and footwear created an unprecedented countrywide demand for dressmakers, tailors, cobblers and drapery shops. More jobs, in other words. And however poor their working conditions, and we've been hearing about how poor some of those working conditions were, waged and salaried workers had set time off. And therefore, you had seamstresses and shop assistants, factory workers and railway guards, clerks, teachers and telegra telegraphists, learning Irish first aid or other skills, rowing on rivers, kicking football, making novenas, playing in bands, and of course, as we now know well, joining trade unions and other organisations. Irish people were still on the move out of Ireland. Emigration figures remained high in this 20 year period, 1891 to 1911, this 30 year period. Emigration remained high, but the young and the single of both sexes were in a state of perpetual motion as well. By 1900, almost the entire country was crisscrossed by railway lines, big and small, which enabled people to cover not only long, but comparatively short everyday distances for work and for leisure all over Leinster, Munster, Ulster, and in southern and eastern Connacht. Gaps in transport provision were made up for by the bicycle, increasingly affordable to people of all classes. Now, because imagination is what we're talking about today, the two people whose lives I am using to illustrate the social changes of this period were writers, the novelist Annie M. P. Smithson and the poet Francis Ledwidge. They were different from each other in almost every way, gender, religious background, social class, occupation, geographical origin, even length of years. Smithson lived into old age, Ledwidge died young, and I'm not being flippant when I say that there were some distinct advantages to being female in the first two decades of the 20th century anywhere in the Western world. You, you, were, you ran less chance of being killed in combat, although I know Linda is going to talk about a different aspect of that. But both Smithson and Ledwidge were active adults in the decade of war and revolution. Uh, both were nationalists, both were trade unionists, and crucially, both developed the confidence to express themselves creatively. And by the way, I'm not making any literary judgments on either of them, even though they are writers, both of whom I enjoy in different ways. I'm interested in them today as exemplars of their time. Now, Annie Smithson was the older of the two, born in 1873 in Dublin into a middle-class Protestant family which gradually fell on hard times. By the age of 21, she was that familiar figure, the non-earning daughter, helping her overwhelmed mother to rear a young family. A sympathetic aunt helped her to get away to train as a nurse in London and Edinburgh. Smithson returned to Ireland in 1900 to become a jubilee nurse, one of those key apostles of public health. And over the next three decades, she worked on the district in Down, Clare, Offaly, Donegal, Mayo, Waterford and Dublin City. She became a Catholic around 1907 and around 1916 became an Irish nationalist, joining Conman Naman during the War for Independence. Her first best-selling novel entitled Her Irish Heritage was published in 1917 and it was directly about the female revolutionary experience. 
Smithson went on to write 19 more best-selling novels, many with women as their central characters, many about the revolutionary experience. All was a fighter for nurses' working rights. In 1929, she became secretary of the Irish Nurses' Union, later the Irish Nurses' Organisation. And she more than quadrupled the membership between then, in 1929, and 1942, when she stepped down. She died in 1948. Frances Lidwich was born in Slane County Meath in 1887, the eighth of nine children. His father was an agricultural labourer who died when Francis was five. And all through Francis's childhood, his mother, Anne, worked as an agricultural labourer. Sometimes the fatherless family lived through hardships so severe that, as Lidwidge later put it, it was as though God forgot us. Francis left school at 14 and held various jobs until he became a road mender employed by the county council, eventually rising to the position of ganger. From his school days, he was always writing, and his first poem was published in 1910 in the Drogheda Independent. After publishing some more poems, he came to the attention of Lord Dunsany, a writer and poet whose help was of great significance. Ledwidge's first book of poems, Songs of the Fields, was published in 1914. As well as being involved in various cultural organisations, Ledwidge founded the Slane branch of the Mead Labour Union, and in 1913, got a clerical job as secretary of this union. A founder member of the Irish Volunteers in Slane, Ledwidge chose to follow John Redmond and joined the British Army, serving in Serbia and on the Western Front. He continued to write until his death at Ypres in Belgium in 1917. So two very different people, both of whose lives, though, reflected the changing times. Nursing and road mending were responsibilities taken on by the public authorities at the turn of the 20th century. Both were extremely demanding jobs physically. The demands of road mending are obvious, but nursing at that stage involved an awful lot of pulling and dragging, not to mention the risk of infection. Smithson contracted tuberculosis between 1912 and 13, as she puts it, her health broke down and she recovered in a sanatorium. And district nursing, of course, also involved travel on bicycles over long distances, on call, seven days a week in all weathers. The bicycle was crucial to Ledwich too. At one stage, he was covering 40 miles a day, going to and from work. He too had several bouts of illness. But Smithson and Ledwich were lucky in the sense that their jobs were relatively secure and permanent. And in other ways, both writers benefited from very real improvements in social provisions in late 19th and early 20th century Ireland. The Ledwidges, poor though they were, had moved into a solid three-bedroomed brick house built by the Rural District Council when Francis was a baby. So at least they had that comfort and dignity. And as John Cunningham has pointed out, they were not exceptional. The Irish rural labouring class was the best housed rural labouring class in Europe on the eve of the First World War. And although Ledwidge left school at 14, he had, up to then, the advantage not only of free national schooling, but also of a teacher famed for learning and dedication, Master Thomas Madden, who encouraged his poetry, really, and encouraged his literary ambitions. Smithson had a very patchy early education, as a lot of girls from her background did. She eventually got to school in Bray in her early teens and gained honours in her junior grade intermediate certificate. These state exams, again, this is another social benefit, these had been introduced in 1878 and they were open to girls as well as to boys on an equal level. However, Ledwidge, just as Ledwidge had to leave school at 14 to support his mother and younger brother, Smithson had to leave school at 16 to help her mother with a new baby. For working class boys and girls, and for lower middle class girls as well, family needs always came before individual fulfilment. Smithson felt guilty all her life at having seized her independence when it was offered to her. Just a little biographical note about both of them. Smithson never married. She did fall in love with a married doctor in County Down when she was younger. It didn't obviously work out. She gave him up. And after that, she didn't marry. Probably like an awful lot of other single working women in Ireland right up to the 1960s, she didn't want to give up her job and her independence uh, by getting married. Ledwidge was 30 when he died. He had had a number of girlfriends at that stage. He probably would have married had he survived the war. 
um, working men, working class men, particularly men with active uh, cultural organisational lives, needed women to, to wash and cook and clean for them because they couldn't afford servants. And that's not any reflection on, on him, but that's the way things were. For, for working women, a husband was perhaps sometimes additional work. For the working man, uh, the, the, the wife was a distinct advantage. Margaret O'Callaghan has said that working class men and women in general, they were among the groups that lost the peace, who were cast adrift somewhat in independent Ireland, and this is true. She also mentioned longing, which I thought was, was lovely, because longing is why we write and why we read. And both of these people expressed longing in different ways, in very different literary ways as well, uh, in the early part of the 20th century. And their voices remained strong into the first half, in, in independent Ireland, in the first decades of independent Ireland. Ledwidge's poems went into several editions over the succeeding decades and were regularly anthologised. Irish people obviously appreciated these meditations on human nature that evoked rural life. Smithson's novels were republished. They were all bestsellers and they were republished regularly by Talbot Press up to the 1960s. Again, readers, and not only women, must have appreciated the theme of strong women working out their destinies. By the way, Smithson was only one of many Irish female writers Novelists, biographers, travel writers, and essayists were published between the 1920s and the 1960s, but that's a story for another day. For now, we are standing in 1921. We are seeing what Smithson saw and what Ledwidge would have seen had he survived the war. A world that each of them firmly believed was theirs to evoke, to record, and indeed to shape and to define. Gorham Hargraves.